Rafe for Hope, um, co Rafe for Hope, uh, Rafe Chapman. Um, I'm uh, with the Centre for Sustainable Cities here in Wellington, although the Centre is a group that goes beyond Wellington. Uh, but um, welcome here today, and um, I'm going to say a few words of introduction and then pass over to the two speakers we've got, to uh, illustrious speakers. Um, and I think this should be a, a very interesting session today. Um, so let me say a few words right to begin with about the New Zealand Centre of Sustainable Cities. We've been going about a decade, I guess, uh, and uh, we've had an interest in, in how we can shape cities to be more um, resilient, sustainable, and uh, a little greener, um, and also uh, a, a generate a good quality of life. And, and that has been a challenge at times in, in Wellington and other places, um, with growing populations and uh, the challenges of climate change and other things, uh, maintaining biodiversity, for example. Um, I think we've do, been doing pretty well in Wellington, although I thought the Dominion Post headline this morning about New Zealand, uh, sorry, Wellington being greener than ever was uh, pushing it a bit. Um, that was, uh, I must have a talk to Olivia Warren about beating it up, but, but, but it probably wasn't her uh, headline. Um, in any case, Wellington is a pretty good place to live, but there's a lot more that can be done. We're at an interesting moment in, uh, in history at, at this point because we're about to elect a new mayor, a new local body election, of course, councillors as well. Um, but we've also got a new district plan coming up and we've got a lot of challenges in terms of meeting the government's um, goals around climate change and you know, emission reduction, uh, transforming our uh, transport system, our buildings, the way we live, uh, and that all has to happen in pretty short order. So um, we've got to get our act together and do it um, with alacrity. So today um, we've got some experts in urban design and um, uh, two, two people who, you know, been there, done that, um, been there in the sense of really good practitioner experience. Um, I'm going to introduce those two. Uh, first is Crystal Olin, um, wherever she's gone. Uh, right. And um, she, she's a, really an authority on urban design in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, Hello? <laughs> She's right here, right? Oh, there you are. In the shadows. Okay. Um, very good. Um, and she's uh, working with the New Zealand Centre for Sustainable Cities, uh, which is based at University of Otago here in Wellington, not just by its name, Otago. Um, and um, uh, she's, she's got 15 years of international experience around, you know, being a practitioner, but also in local government with the leadership. Um, research and university teaching, so it's a great mix. Um, and uh, I recently read some of her articles, and um, they, you know, suggest a real profound knowledge of not only the the practice but the the theory of urban design as well. Um, she's uh, got an emphasis on on place making in her work, place stewardship, community formation, and medium density design quality, and that really um, brings us to what she's been doing recently um, and she was urban design manager at Wellington City Council and led the team uh, responsible for delivering urban design strategy, design review and public space delivery. And now at the um, Centre for Sustainable Cities she's um, moved into a sort of management position. She's co-deputy director of, of um, uh, program called the Public Housing and Urban Regeneration Program, which is a $12 million endeavour fund. Um, MB, you know, hands out the money, but uh, it's funded by a thing called the Endeavour Fund. And um, it's, a re it's a research program uh, which is designed to, you know, elicit and, and establish a lot of information and knowledge about um, how public housing could be done better and how um, it can contribute to the aims that we've, I've just talked about. Um, we're looking for robust evidence to improve the well-being of people living in public housing as well as their whānau and communities. So that's Crystal. Um, and I, let me just say something about um, Dr. Fazad Tamani, um, who is down here. <laughs> 
Um, welcome to you too, um, Dr. Sumani. Um, he's um, a practitioner at the Council, and one of our aims with the um, set of sustainable cities seminars, of which this is one, um, <clears throat> is to put a, um, a researcher alongside a practitioner, so uh, to get that interplay, that conversation. And he, um, Fazad, led the Wellington District Plan Design Guide Review, uh, so he's right in there, and, and the drafting of the new design guides, which are now notified under the proposed new district plan, which, as I say, is still being, you know, finalised. He's um, from the Kashkai tribe in Iran, um, which I've been hearing is, you know, has been a nomadic tribe that has largely settled down in, in recent decades. Um, and um, uh, he completed his Bachelor of Architecture in Iran before going off to the UK to do his Masters, and um, then a PhD at University of Auckland. And um, he's looked at the relationship and conflict between people, power structures, and city design. So good theoretical background, but also um, uh, a good practitioner um, you know, experience. Two years ago, he moved to Wellington to, make it, to take up the role of design review team leader at the city council. And um, he's got wide interests from housing to urban regeneration to, and design processes. So um, on that note, let me hand over to <laughs> Crystal. Thank you. Uh, kia ora koutou. it's really nice to be here. Um, thanks for that introduction, Rafe. And I'm very pleased to be here with my friend and colleague, Faris. So, um, I'll take us through the, the first half of our talk and then I'll hand over to him. So what I'll talk about, I'll sort of set the scene, um, building on what Rafe has just said about the current climate and the current challenges that we're facing. Um, and that's sort of what this call for density is responding to. So I'll talk us through a bit about what's um, on the cards in terms of the density um, that New Zealand is um, currently looking in, into the future um, toward and how to actually do it well or what are some of the important considerations um, and I'd argue design is, is a really important one um, to get right as we densify. So as Rafe um, said, actually, um, Aotearoa New Zealand, and this I'm sure is very familiar to all of you, um, is grappling with really significant challenges right now, um, what some might call um, wicked problems. So we have rising land, house, and rental prices, uh, rising cost of living. It's increasingly an unaffordable place for a lot of people. There's pressure on infrastructure, and that's all sorts of infrastructures, um, and rising sea levels um, that are putting further pressure there's declining availability of developable land and at the same time the responsibility and increasing commitment to protecting the natural land and the other natural resources that we have available to us. Um, and we have a commitment as well as a need to reduce our carbon emissions as Rafe uh, mentioned. We also have a responsibility and an increasing commitment to address the systemic inequities stemming from our country's colonial history. So we have these wicked problems, right, and they're complex and we can't solve them in silos. We need to think across um, domains, so across the economic, the environmental, the social, the cultural, in order to achieve sustainable development. And these are unique to New Zealand. They're contextual, um, they're place-based, um, they're culture-based, um, but they're also not unlike um, those challenges faced globally. So some of you might have heard of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and just to say, they came about in 2015, there's 17 of them. But if you go in and you look at them, you'll, you'll hear some resonance with the challenges that New Zealand is, is facing. There's global challenges that we collectively face as human beings. As I said, the housing is severely unaffordable in this country. Um, these clips are from a few years ago, um, but they're sort of highlighting that housing is um, um, that New Zealand is, is one of the places where housing is least affordable in the world. In addition to that, how, um, New Zealand actually has a higher percentage of standalone um, single-family um, dwellings compared to other countries, so that graph's showing in comparison to Australia there. And as we know, the situation is only sort of intensified with COVID um, coming on board the past few years and housing prices rising a further 20 to 40% and our job um, salary is not actually keeping up with that. So the government is well aware of these challenges um, and is doing things to try and address them, both the lack of, of housing affordability as well as the lack 
of um, housing availability in the country. So I just thought it was useful to highlight some of the big moves that have um, been made over the last few years. I won't read through these in detail, and there's some people in the room who are more expert on each of these than I am. Um, but I just wanted to sort of list them out to say these things are, are happening. Um, and to point out that actually the first three of these um, that I've got listed, um, so the National Policy, Policy Statement on Urban Development and the Government Policy Statement on Housing and Urban Development, and the Mahi Kaora um, Maori Housing Strategy and its Associated Implementation Plan, all speak to some extent about the importance of quality um, as we increase the housing supply and affordability and what that means to the well-being of people and sustainability of our cities. The last one on the list there is the uh, medium density residential standards which have come into effect as of last month. Um, so that's, if for those of you who aren't aware, that's um, an RMA amendment that basically allows up to the development of up to three homes three homes up to three stories on any given site um, without the need for resource consent. Um, so on one hand, this is a, a great signal from um, the government about the importance of um, densifying in a sustainable way. Um, on the other hand, it might be challenging because we've lost one of those checkpoints potentially on some developments um, to assure the design quality is there. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, what is MDH, or medium density housing? Um, this is a handy sort of um, description on the brand's website that you can go to if you're unfamiliar. But um, basically, we're trying to densify in a way, we're trying to accommodate the growth that we need to accommodate and house the people that we need to house in a way that's not going to sprawl out and eat up our land and be unsustainable, but also in a way that's gonna create um, healthy neighborhood environments that hopefully people can thrive in. That's the goal anyway. Um, in other words, I, heard, I went to the Affordable Housing and Development Summit in Auckland last week and there was a nice little soundbite from the um, CE of Hutt City Council. She said, we're trying to transform the Kiwi dream from the quarter acre lot into the quarter hour city. So instead of striving for us each having our own um, standalone home with a front yard or a backyard or both, um, we're striving now to have collective environments where you can walk um, hopefully easily or take public transport easily or cycle easily within 15 minutes to get to a range of um, goods and services. Of course, this is scary in New Zealand. Um, human beings have been living in medium density um, environments for hundreds of centuries, for hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years in some locations. It's not new to humanity. But New Zealand is a young country. Um, I come from the States originally. I thought the States was a young country. And New Zealand's even younger. Um, so it is scary. It's new. Um, and, and that's coming out in the media that people are scared of what this medium density means, right? Um, but it doesn't need to be scary. Um, there's, a, there's quite a good little piece of research um, that my colleague Karen Witten and a couple of her colleagues did up in Auckland um, a few years ago. Um, that speaks to um, the community sort of um, apprehension about and then potential acceptance of medium density in their neighborhoods. Just a, a few key things to point out about the findings from that study um, is that when you actually design and situate and build medium density housing well, people will come to a greater acceptance of it. It's the, it's the slapped up, quick, low quality stuff that people respond poorly to. Of course, there's always challenges with um, construction and all that kind of thing as we as we develop our city so there's an importance about um, developers and construction workers being neighborly or, or friendly as they go about the process but a really important point also to point out is that we can't actually achieve medium density housing and people and ask people to get out of their cars expect people to get out of their cars and choose other modes if we don't have that supportive infrastructure in place at the same time so we need access to good public transport options and that needs to be a addressed immediately and alongside our intensification of housing or else there won't be that greater acceptance. So that's really key. Um, alongside other cities in Aotearoa, Wellington is densifying. So this is just a quick little clip from um, the introduction to the design guides for Wellington City Council's district plan that far as we'll talk in more depth to. Um, but just to say that we know that Wellington's going to grow by 50 to 80,000 people over the next 30 years. We know that change is coming, it's ongoing, it's already here, um, and that it actually can be done well, and we have an important um, opportunity now to actually get it right. 
for the people who currently call Wellington their home, as well as for the people who will call Wellington home in the future, and for our environment and our responsibilities around looking after, after um, our planet and the places we live. So as I said, a lot of people call Wellington their home and more people will call Wellington their home um, into the future. So one thing I think that's really important to keep in mind as we densify is how we can continue um, to foster um, people feeling at home, being at home in our city as it, as it changes and grows. So home is a complex notion, right? There's many definitions. It's different for everybody. Um, I think this is a lovely way of putting it from Amohia Bolton, um, that home is a place of belonging, safety, connection and acceptance to people and communities, not simply to a physical location or dwelling. It's a place of spiritual safety and connection with tipuna or ancestors. So being at home means being connected, right? It means being connected with people and with place. So that connection with place is a, is a really interesting concept. There's lots of names for it, sense of place. The Romans used to like to say genius loci um, or spirit of the place. Architects love that term. Um, or place attachment. Um, but either way, however you define it or however you put it, it's really important. So when people feel attached to the place, the communities feel more empowered. They're more likely to... Um, to look after the places that they love. Um, and there's actually, um, uh, being attached to a place, feeling connected to a place is a good predictor of well-being. It can also be enhanced by uh, people's ability to move around the places where they live um, and enjoy those spaces um, in, in accessible ways. So thinking about, for example, the streets that we live as, as potentially as third places. So those places in addition to home and work that you, you live the rest of your life. So, that could be streets if we design them well. It can also be parks, playgrounds, rivers, um, plazas, whatever it is. Um, part of the reason that people feel connected to a place is because they feel connected to the people in a place, um, in addition to being connected to the place um, in and of itself. And we know, and especially after the last few years of lockdowns, that social isolation and loneliness is a huge public health factor um, and that there are some pretty negative um, health and well-being effects associated with being lonely and isolated. And physical isolation, so working alone or living alone, um, or both of those, can amplify that isolation and then the negative impacts that go along with that. I'd argue that the neighborhood um, can be understood as an extension of home, so when we talk about home, I'd like you to sort of open your minds and think about not just the individual dwelling, your sort of enclave that you can lock the doors and close down at night, but actually your experience of home extends beyond the doorstep and into that neighborhood environment. And, and as you go about your everyday activities, and you go shopping, you go to work, you take your kids to school or whatever it is, um, you're actually um, you're experiencing home and shaping memories of home in a wider sense than just the individual dwelling which underscores the importance of us um, really designing those collective environments well as we densify into the future. It's worth remembering that each neighborhood or, or area that we create in a city actually makes various lifestyles or realities possible. There's always going to be a diversity, um, but there is a shaping um, that happens. So built environments can't predict or force or um, you know, uh, shape human behavior per se but they definitely do influence it and they provide a setting in which be human behavior um, and, and all of the wonders of, of and joys of life take place. So we need to get our neighborhoods right. So what matters in the design of the neighborhood? If we think back to um, Rafe's introduction in that first slide where I talked about these big challenges and these wicked problems, um, we need our, our neighborhoods to do a lot. So we need them not only to address affordability and capacity issues um, with housing, but we also need them to respond to environmental challenges and be meaningful and effective in responding to contextual and cultural sensitivities at scale and I'd say increasingly at pace as well. As I mentioned, the neighborhood needs to facilitate connection with people and with place. And so accordingly, neighborhood design must be integrated. It can't be siloed off. It needs to work across domains and it needs to be coordinated um, with that connectivity to essential infrastructures. So that being transport, community, environmental, and other um, infrastructures such as energy and food. Um, the way that we lay out our cities um, sticks. So streets um, and the street patterns that we lay out last a lot longer. They last for centuries. Um, 
um, they last a lot longer than individual buildings. So the individual buildings may be demolished, may be replaced. Hopefully we start building buildings that last longer than 50 years. Um, but even so, the, the streets will last longer. So it's important we lay out our neighborhoods and our streets um, in ways that are sustainable and good for people and the environment. Once we have a street laid out, we can also make it work harder to try and achieve those things that we need the neighborhood to achieve. So for those of you who aren't aware, this is a handy resource I just thought I'd, I'd point out, the Global Street Design Guide. Um, it's developed um, out of New York City, um, but it's actually led by a woman from New Zealand, from Dunedin, Sky Duncan. So I've had the pleasure of meeting and collaborating with her, actually. She's a lovely person. But you can see here the difference that you can achieve when you, when you really think about streetscape design and how to make that street um, actually try to achieve a number of those things on behalf of the wider neighborhood and what we're trying to do. Um, to address those challenges. So on the left-hand side, you see a, a street with good bones, but very car dominated. It's kind of doing one thing. It's sort of accommodating cars coming in and out and, and being stored for various periods of time. On the right-hand side, you see what might be possible if we think outside of the box a little bit. And we don't have to reinvent the wheel, which is why this guide is helpful. Um, but you can make space for um, pedestrians and cyclists and green infrastructure, which will become increasingly important as we try to address rising sea levels. Um, for example, and also um, it's good for human beings to be in greener environments. Um, so that's useful to, to think about. This is also just to say that the infrastructure um, coordination extends to the underground infrastructure. Importantly, this is a great little diagram that makes it look very clean and easy. Of course, it's very complicated and messy. Um, but if we get that underground infrastructure planned ahead of time and coordinated with what we want to achieve above ground, um, we have a um, much better chance of sustaining our cities well and, and our people well into the future. So just as an example, we, we can't plant trees a lot of places in the city because we don't have um, the pipes coordinated and the, and the roots of the tree would interfere with the pipes. And then, you know, so we, we've got to actually get these things right. Here's a great little quote from Fred Kent in the States. Um, if you plan for cities and cars and traffic, sorry, if you plan cities for cars and traffic, you get cars and traffic. But if you plan cities for people and places, you get people and places. And behind the quote, you can see a before and after of New York City's Times Square. So the before is what I, was, what I saw when I was last there in 2007, which is basically a glorified traffic island um, <laughs> uh, with lots of billboards, of course. Um, and, and below is, is the um, transformation that it's um, started to, I think it's actually progressed even further than what you see there, but basically become a place where people can spend time out of their cars and doing all the variety of things that you can't do while you're sitting in your car. I would argue that we could extend that, that term cars um, and think about other reasons that we might be designing cities and what impact that might have. So what does it mean if we're designing our cities for capital gain or for efficiencies, for status, for politics? What if we're designing out of fear? Or what if we're designing only for short-term wins? What are we missing out on? Um, are we actually missing out on those longer-term sustainability goals? Are we missing out on designing our places for people. So if we keep that longer term in mind um, and we keep the people in mind, let's go back to the scale of, of, of a house, of a dwelling. What matters in the design of a dwelling? Um, this is a great quote by Bachelard in, in his book, The Poetics of Space, which I recommend you read if you haven't already. And he says, I should say the house shelters daydreaming, the house protects the dreamer, the house allows one to dream in peace. And basically that's saying a house needs to be a home and not just a house. It could be an apartment, it could be a townhouse, it can be a variety of different things, but people need home as shelter um, that allows them to be vulnerable, that allows them to feel protected and safe into the foreseeable future. So we need that longevity um, and we need to get the design right um, and, and, and we need to bring the people along with us so that they feel at home. When we break that down a little bit more, um, you know, just to reiterate that, you know, again, we don't need the, the greater, um, just the greater quantity of housing. We need that greater quality. And when we break down what that quality means, there are different ways of, of, of framing it. So um, the sister sort of research group to New Zealand Centre for Sustainable Cities, Hei Kainga Oranga, has done really prolific work over the last what, 30 years or so. Um, looking at that um, indoor environment and connecting back to health and well-being outcomes and really um, being a huge part of making change in achieving healthy homes um, throughout the country or trying to achieve healthy homes throughout the country. We've still got a long ways to go. Um, 
And there are other things that we need to think about as well. So the architecture, the physical structure, um, what are the materials and the methods of construction? These things, you know, impact on the on the indoor environment um, and also on the sustainability. Um, cool. I'll finish up quickly. Uh, we need to think about the interior layout and the functionality. Is there enough storage space? Is there enough common area for the amount of rooms? Um, is it culturally appropriate for the, the lifestyles that a family or an individual um, need to, to lead? Is the home safe? Is it accessible? Um, you know, what is that public-private interface? What is the interaction with the outdoor environment like, um, that neighborhood environment? What are the aesthetics? What's that visual language or style that people might resonate with and, and begin to draw themselves to living there and calling it their home? And of course, lived experiences are complex and the ways in which people understand and experience home is, is, is very complex and, and influenced by a number of different contexts. So there's sort of no one mold fits all, um, but we do have certain principles that we know work or, or don't work. Um, so just quickly to mention, there is some um, really cool design guidance out there for those of you unaware. There's a new book out by architect Guy Marriage, um, which I believe is free online, which is pretty cool. Um, so that's technical um, guidance on trying to achieve medium density housing well. There's also some um, good guidance on the brand's website that um, touches on a number of the things I've already talked about. And one of the things, interesting, interestingly, that Brands um, notes is the importance of design review. So having, having those opportunities to be able to evaluate what's being proposed and make sure those design outcomes are good for our city and our people and our environment into the long term. So on that note, I'll, I'll hand over to um, Faris and he can talk to you about what um, is happening in the design review space in Wellington City. Thank you. Kia ora tato. Uh, my name is Fares. I'm the Acting City Design Manager for Wellington City Council. Um, interestingly enough, Crystal hired me two years and a half, half ago, so I have the honour and pleasure of working for Wellington City Council mainly because of Crystal. Um, firstly, I want to acknowledge uh, Mana Whenua, Tarna Kifanui, Te Atiawa and Ngāti Toa for having us on their land. Secondly, I would like to acknowledge you for having me here, especially the Center of Sustainable Cities. It's a pleasure to talk to you guys. Uh, and also, I, I would like to acknowledge you for coming during your lunch break uh, and listening to us. This is, this is great. Um, uh, what I'm going to talk to you about is probably telling you some kind of secret insights in, from Council that how it works to kind of give effect to all the good things that Crystal mentioned. And, and of course it's not easy, it's a daily constant battle to get better design outcomes for the city. But this is kind of a bit of a taste of what happens there um, in terms of the design review, the design guides and the district plan. So the timeline that you can see, 2017 to 2025, is a very, very long process. Currently we are basically at 2022, July. July late 2022, so we are kind of there now. Uh, next week, the, the, the submissions on the district plan will end and, and uh, giving you a bit of a brief, you started with the engagement on our city tomorrows. We had a number of goals that I will talk to. Uh, then we had further consultation, engagement, then eventually we got the spatial plan approved. Then we released the draft district plan, so the, the draft design guides was part of that. We got lots of submissions uh, and we gave effect to those submissions. We heard people's concerns and then we notified the district plan. Now is in the notification process. What does that mean? Is that basically the legal RMA process to get submissions? So after the first round of submissions, we review those submissions, we put them back out again to the public. People will submit on top of the submissions, that's the beauty of the, the process. And then eventually it will go to independent hearing panels. There will be a number of commissioners that they will hear people's kind of concerns, uh, submissions, and eventually we will uh, make the district plan operative. There's kind of a very complex side to this. Uh, this time there is 60% of the district plan almost will be fast tracked, the other 40% goes to schedule one, which is the usual way. So it can go to environment court and takes longer and that's why you go to 2025. But we are hoping that most of it will be kind of operative by 2024. Design guides 
is part of that fast track process. Uh, so, what are the design guides and what is the design review? So, when I started, I was the team leader for the design review team, and it's kind of a bit of a secret to people what they do. Uh, the design review team is a squad of urban designers, architects, landscape architects, planners, and their main kind of bread and butter is to look at new urban development kind of resource concerns and they assess them. How do they assess them? They use the design guides. So currently they use the operative design guides, the old one, and as part of the district plan review, we decided to review them for a number of reasons that I will talk to. And this is how it looks like in the proposed district plan. So you can see in the appendices, design guides and schedules. One thing that you need to consider, the Wellington City Council, I guess, is the only council in the country that have the design guides as part of the district plan. So it's a statutory document, which gives us more kind of legal leverage in order to achieve better outcome. What is in the design guides is number of chapters and introduction, centres and mixed use design guides, so central city, all the suburban centres, metropolitan centres, residential design guides, which has number of sub-chapters, heritage design guides, signs, so all those billboards, they, they need to be assessed against the design guides, uh, subdivisions and rural design guides. As you can see, that's all of them together, and that's me. And that's one of the workshops we had uh, with Monofenua. We had a number of workshops with Monofenua, and that was one of the key things that we wanted to address. The old design guides didn't really have much around the Maori kind of word views and an identity, and we wanted to kind of address that deficiency and lack of Monofenua within the design guides. Uh, so when we did the engagement on, on the spatial plan and our city tomorrow, people told us that they want to achieve these things for Wellington City. So people said, oh, Wellington doesn't have a vision. Well, actually we do, and this is what people told us. So there are six goals in our our city tomorrow vision document, partnership with Monofenua. We want a city that's compact, is inclusive, is greener. Wellingtonians really love the green is resilient, of course we have resilience issues, and also is vibrant and prosperous. So we really need to tell their story. As part of telling their story, we decided to turn these design principles to, uh, sorry, turn these goals to design principles, and so we basically looked at them through a design lens. And on the back of that, we came with a number of outcomes. One of the key changes in the the, the proposed design guys is shifting from a rule-based approach to an outcome-based approach. So currently you can have a development that is kind of complying with all the design guides, but it's actually not a really good design outcome. And that was the big shift, how we can achieve good design outcomes even though that you don't meet all the design guides. And that's why we put these design outcomes on the top of the hierarchy of the design guides. How did we structure them? we kind of looked at the scale. The first one is around responding to the, to the natural environment, so putting the earth, the planet, you know, the big picture, land, water, people, first. So that's the first thing that you need to look at when you design a new multi-unit development or apartment. The second one is about the relationship between that development and the city. So if we bring it back down one level, the third one is about functioning sites. So you have a parcel of land, number of buildings, how they interact, with, with each other, the open spaces, the communal spaces between them. That's the third layer of the outcomes. And lastly, is around each building. So the current operative design guys is quite heavy on the buildings, but not much about the other three. So how the buildings, so all the things Crystal mentioned around the neighborhood design, that will have more emphasis in the proposed design guys how the building interact with the city, interact with the streets, and interact with each other. So one of the, as I mentioned, one of the key changes is basically hearing Monofenua stories. Um, acknowledging these in an appropriate and considered way offers an opportunity to create a unique sense of place um, for any kind of new development. Well, so what does that mean? If you look at the design guides now, the proposed one, you don't see many Maori words. And that was intentional. We wanted to distill the concepts. The concept of Manakitanga, the concept of Kaitiakitanga. 
So caring for each other and caring for the planet to be at the core of the design guides. And, and that kind of happened through a number of workshops with Manofenua and the representative to make sure that we get it right. They reviewed it multiple times and they were relatively happy. There were a number of other things that we could have done, but it wasn't within the scope of the design guides or RMA. And we are working to see how we can give effect to them in different projects. I don't think I need to really talk to climate change that much, but we all know that it's happening with the flooding, um, irregular weather kind of situations, um, storms, uh, sea level rise is a big, big part of the design guys, is a big part of the district plan. Uh, this is my personal view, it's not council view, uh, but we may have a flooding crisis in many Wellingtons, uh, in many kind of New Zealand cities in the near future. So how do we address the water problems is quite key. Um, hydraulic neutrality, which is basically, uh, you shouldn't negatively impact the stormwater systems when you do a new, new development. That's going to be a big part of the proposed district plan. And we have a number of design guides that would address that within the limitations of the design guides. It's not, it's not very easy to do that, but, but we try to cover as much as we can to address not the climate change challenges that we have now only, but also the climate challenges that we may face in future. And of course, as Crystal mentioned, density, height, and new housing types. We need to densify. The question is that how do we do that? How do we do it well? And when done well, density can increase general well-being of people through improved social connection, opportunities, safety, and accessibility. Many people, when they hear, especially in the context of New Zealand, about density, they kind of get, there is a fear. They, they get scared. Uh, I, the example that I always use, imagine you walk into a big space and there's literally no one and it's dark and you don't see anyone, street, and it's just fences and walls. And that's one scenario. The other scenario is that you walk down the street and you see a couple having a glass of wine, kids playing uh, on, on the grass and, and someone greeting someone else uh, in front of the entrance. Which one do you feel safer? And that's what density does. It brings people together and having and seeing people, having those chances to socially interact with each other can make the city way safer, even that bigger number of people live within close proximity. And that's what we want to, to achieve. Uh, so from now on, I'm going to give you real examples. So how does it really work? So there are a number of, I, I picked a number of design guides from the proposed design guide to show you when the design review team receive a resource consent, how do they assess it? So the first one is around basically fitting in. If you go for the first time to a house party or a dinner and you don't know them, you don't want to appear to be like a dick, you know? People won't like you. <laughs> this is, this design guys, which is our number one design guide, is basically trying to do that, tell you don't be a dick if you come to a neighborhood. Uh, Try to be respectful of the context that, that you enter. So doing that contextual analysis helps the architect, developers, and council to understand whether that new development would fit in. That doesn't mean that you should be exactly the same or do the same thing. You can actually be quite eclectic and dress differently, but you can actually be respectful at the same time. Second one, I will read the G23. Um, ensure the site layout orients residential units to face the public space, the street, communal open space of the development to avoid side-facing buildings. Again, imagine you walk down the street and there's all these buildings with their side to you, so you just see blank walls. That's what we don't want to happen. We want the buildings to face the street. I know it sounds quite simple, but it's not really. When, when we see actual development, we see that side wall facing the street. So we have to kind of go through that process to make sure that the living rooms, the kitchen, the bedrooms, they face the street rather than each other, sorry. Uh, and, and those diagrams trying to kind of depict that, that you either face your communal space or you face the street. Um, and that kind of, the, the, the issues Crystal mentioned around social interactions, that's how it will be implemented in a real life kind of scenario. 
And a lot of time, architects get annoyed with us, but you know, that's part of life. Um, the other thing is around the garages. So I'm not, I mean, I do that, but it's not like I'm, I'm not trying to bash Auckland. But <laughs> <laughs> when you walk down some of the streets in Auckland, it's just car parks. You walk down the street and it's hundreds and hundreds of garages, car, car parks, car yards, whatever. That's what we don't want to happen in Wellington. And, and, and we push back, like I know some of my team members is here, and, and we really push back against lining up the streets with garages and car parks. Uh, mainly is for safety. So New Zealand has a big issue of kids being hit in by, uh, on the driveways. Uh, people reversing down, but also it just removed that interaction between people and the people who walk on the street. So we would like to have more front yards planting vegetation or people uh, rather than places for storing your car, your car. Still, you can have a car park if you want to. You need to put it at the back. Um, the other thing, I know cycleways are quite controversial and I deal with them quite often, but uh, now, uh, but if, if we really want to achieve a sustainable city and address our climate change issues, we need to shift our transport models to a more sustainable way. That requires our private developments to, to respond to the public infrastructure that we're providing. So if we are asking people to cycle or to use electric vehicles, our private developments need to have that kind of infrastructure within them to enable residents to comfortably do that. So what does that mean? By more bicycle storage, EV chargers, and so on. And these kind of G73, as you can see, there's many design guides. I'm just picking up some of them to make sure that, um, that you know, people can use the you know, e-bike or whatever they use comfortably. The other kind of quite a big one in the new design guys is the communal spaces. People that, that was kind of we heard quite clearly from, from people who live in apartments. They, they want more communal spaces and they want them to be designed nicely. It shouldn't be a leftover space that is shaded and is dark and you can't really use it. It should be somewhere that you can go and have barbecue with your cousins or something. Um, and, and, and that design guys tries to achieve that. You may wonder how does it really work? So you go to a basically pre-app meeting, pre-application meeting, and the urban designer of council remind the applicant of these design guides and tells them that you need to consider this. How do you consider that, that there's different approaches? But this is how we assist. This gives us that kind of background knowledge that, that you need to do this, and then applicants can read it in advance and say, ah, oh, we need to consider the communal space and the design of that, so they can hire a landscape architect to design that appropriately so it can be used nicely. Uh, i just give you a kind of funny example. I had a, I had a meeting with a really large developer, I'm not going to name them, uh, and they had this tiny area in a corner with a barbecue in it. And I told them, you either never lived in an apartment you never barbecued anything, or you would think we are a fool, because that barbecue doesn't work. <laughs> there, there was literally no space, so you probably had to barbecue and walk 200 meters to serve it somewhere else, and the sausages get cold. Like, who would do that? Um, so we really look at the pr practicality of these things. Uh, this is another interesting one, and again, people really complain. I think someone from Johnsonville told me once, that they don't like these cookie cutter same townhouses that happens. And we know that we don't want them, we don't like them. Uh, and we really push for kind of a sense of identity and belonging. Um, imagine you break up with your partner and you end up by chance buying two units in the same development. If they look the same, oh, first of all, you shouldn't do that, but if they look the same, that's really shit. Like you don't want to exactly own the same looking houses because people are different. They want a sense of identity for the place that they live in. So that, how that can be done? Either the designers need to design them kind of differently with different design features, or we need to give people the opportunity to appropriate their space depending on their need or their taste. Or, so that kind of, the power of appropriation is quite significant. And when people 
feel a sense of belonging or a sense of ownership, they take care of place very more. They feel, they feel that, that they care about their neighbours more. While if you don't have any sense of belonging, you don't care. And that happens quite often. Light and sun, you all know, we, we love sun, we, we love light, but sometimes we really need to remind people that you need to do that, and that's why we have such design guides. Um, accessibility, this is, people who are expert in RMA, they know that this is gonna be a difficult one to go through the re regulatory process, and we really worked hard with our lawyers to word them in a way that we can argue that it's not necessarily messing with the Building Code and Building Act, but we try to ensure that everyone, the future fathers uh, and mothers of this country, can have an easy life, you know, carrying a pram. Uh, I'm going to get old. I would like to live in a place that I can walk up, down, up and down stairs. So this is basically making sure everyone, not only people with disabilities, uh, can have a kind of dignified life. And the last one, City Outcome Contribution, again, another new policy in the design guides. Uh, we had something called design excellence, which if you go above the height limits, you need to achieve design excellence. So we replaced it with City Outcome Contribution. So what is it? It basically tells you, if you want to go above height, you need to do good things for the city. Or, reverse it, if you do good things for the city that we can't generally achieve, for example, People say, oh, why we don't have buildings that they all green star? So under RMA, we can't require the applicant to do green star. But with an incentive, we say, if you do green star, you get this many points, which means you can go above your height limits and do more, but only if you contribute back to the city. And that's a new policy. It's been very well received from developers, but also from the public, because it's kind of a win-win scenario if we get it operative. And lastly, for the first time in the country, we have a Papa Koenga design guide. It's not a statutory document, uh, and there is legal issues if we make it statutory, but it's basically, we're not telling Māori architects how to design Papa Koenga, but it's kind of telling council how to deal with it. It's kind of giving the officers a bit of knowledge about what aspects of Papa Koenga they need to look at, uh, so it's more like an educational document, but it's part of the design guides, is, is basically enabling and enhancing our understanding of Papa Kainga. And, and last thing on, on, on the, the Mana Whenua aspect, I started with that I would like to end. If we achieve those concepts that they quite a strong in Tao Māori, that's going to benefit every single one of us. Being, being caring and kind to the land and to the water and to each other is not just what Mana Whenua wants. I think this is everything uh, that every Wellingtonian would like to see. Uh, Mana Whenua put it at the core and forefront of, of the corridor, and that's reminding us how we can do that better in a way that the city is more livable. Uh, Crystal, do you want to talk about the examples or...? Yeah, um, I'm kind of, yeah, done. But these are some of the examples that just show that in reality how these design guys and the, the principles and the theories that Crystal talked about can be implemented in real life. Thank you. Thank you.